Welcome listeners. I am so happy that you're here today. I have Brett Lashinsky with me and we're going to be talking about what to do with your house when you're going through divorce. And it is probably my number one question, maybe number two, if kids are involved when I'm helping people work through a divorce. My eyes have been opened at how important it is to have a qualified mortgage person who specializes and understands divorce. So Brett's going to tell us his authentic story. But before we go there, I just want to let the listeners know what we're going to kind of cover today. And I'm going to be taking notes because this is going to make me a better mediator and I'll be able to serve people better. So the first thing that we're going to kind of talk about is what do mortgage professionals need to see in your divorce paperwork? Very interested to make sure that I'm doing that all right. And just to help people so that they know when they're refinancing what needs to be in their actual divorce paperwork. And then also the next thing we'll talk about is how can child support and maintenance be used to qualify for a mortgage? If you're needing some extra income, we're going to talk about that today. Um, and there's also, there's two parts. There's the title of the property and then there's who's responsible for the mortgage. And I think Brett's going to talk about that issue a little bit. And then some timing issues. Everyone wants to know, well, when can I purchase a new home? You know, what's the right timing? And there are probably pluses and minuses and it probably depends on the circumstances, but we're going to dig deep into that. And then this is the one that everybody's asking now, Brett, is can I keep my current interest rate because they're going up and I like what I've got. So yeah. listeners, we're so fortunate. That's what we're going to cover today with Brett. Brett, can you just share with my listeners what led you to help people who are needing mortgages and going through a divorce and to specialize in this area? Yeah, sure. Well, first, thanks for having me, having me but um the thing, you know, I went through a divorce um, in about 2007, 2008, and I had already been a loan officer for a uh, number of years. And I've been a loan officer for 20 years, but I kind of fell into this divorce space about 12 years ago when some of my past clients actually were going through a divorce. And I realized an underwriting guideline that I didn't know that I didn't know. And I'd been a loan officer for a while, so I, I kind of felt like I knew what I was doing, but I realized that I didn't know what I was doing in this space. So it kind of led me on a um, kind of a, I was just a sponge for everything about uh, how divorces were different in the mortgage world. Um, I called processors, I called underwriters, I called title companies, and I was asking everybody, what is different? What do you see that's different in divorce transactions? And to my surprise, there was quite a bit. So um, over the next year or so, I just, just gathered information. And so I didn't get into the divorce realm because I got divorced, but the fact that I went through a divorce, I feel I've just realized over the years that it's helped me tremendously to really understand what people are going through. I mean, it was the worst time in my life by far when I was going through that and, and that whole time around that. And um, so not everybody is just in this bad space when they're going through divorce, but a lot of people are, and I can kind of empathize with them. And, you know, if I'm not getting somebody's documents very quickly, or, um, you know, there's conversations on the phone that I'm having with people that are, I can just tell they're in a difficult place. Um, there's times I'll take off my mortgage guy hat and just try and be a friend sometimes, but, yeah. um, that's how I got into it. I, I, I didn't get into it because I went through a divorce, but I feel like the divorce that I went through helps me to understand and, uh, relate to the people who, what people are going through. And I just like, I really enjoy helping people. That's the best part of my job. I enjoy helping the people uh, illuminate that pitch black room that they have about their mortgage, right? Of what can I do? What can I can I do? I, can I stay in the house? Um, can I purchase a new house before the divorce is final? Because this is expected to take a long time. And I just really don't feel like I can emotionally stay here for the next six months to a year while we get through this. And just to, to 
give them the information in a 45 minute discussion that answers all their questions and allows them to illuminate that pitch black room. And even if the options that we go through aren't exactly what they are happy with, the, the stress, you can just see the stress fall from their face or their, their voice because at least they know now what they can do, what their options are, and then they can move forward with that. The stress is in not knowing what they are able to do or what their options are. Well, Brett, I want you to know, first of all, how much I appreciate. And most I have the most wonderful guests who have used something that they've gone through that's hard and they're helping people with it now. I mean, my heart just, I love that. So thank you for that. And also what I'm finding, my eyes have been opened. The, I mean, mortgage people are, are awesome, but they don't always understand what's going on in, in a divorce. And I fell prey to just saying, call your mortgage, call your lender, see if you can assume the loan. And I, it's much more in depth than that. And my understanding is, is that people can just give you a call if they have questions. And I'm finding, Brett, that it's right in that initial consultation that I have with people where they have all these questions coming up about the house because it's a big concern for many people about how it's going to work. So do you want to um, go through this step by step or do you want to be circular about it? Because my first question that I was going to ask was, what do mortgage professionals need to see in divorce paperwork? And I'm assuming this is for the person who's refinancing the home or going to own the home on their own, that um, then you put that language in the decree. Are there things sometimes that go missing that you see? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, you first, uh, is it you're assuming that it's just for the person that's refinancing? There is more verbiage that needs to be in the divorce decree for the per person who's keeping the house and refinancing. Um, to remove a name or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but there is language needed in the divorce decree for the person that's exiting the house and going to purchase a home. Okay. Um, so there's a couple things. So one example of the, the person who's exiting the home and going to purchase a new home, if the divorce decree is finalized and it states uh, that the home is awarded to one spouse and the other spouse is indemnified and held harmless from that mortgage payment, which is that indemnification language is template wording for attorneys, but not everybody uses attorneys. So right. if you have a mediator or your pro se or whatever, and you're, 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 you're not using an attorney to draft your, uh, your divorce decree, make sure that's still in there because what that allows is, that allows the person that's going to purchase a home who has their name still on that old loan on the marital home mm -hmm. because either the other person hasn't hasn't removed it yet or um, it, they haven't refinanced yet or maybe they're even going to sell. There's a scenario there, but I won't get too in the weeds there. But if you if you have a divorce decree that indemnifies you and holds you harmless and your credit report still shows that you owe that mortgage debt to Wells Fargo or something the divorce decree actually trumps your credit report. So the divorce decree that says you're indemnified and held harmless from that mortgage payment trumps the credit report that says you still owe that debt. So that's- I love that. I, I, didn't, I didn't even realize that. And so I'm kind of one of those funky mediators who was an attorney that turned into a mediator. So I help, like my clients will have all the documents they need to file for their divorce. So that is in the language on their real estate attachment, usually. Um, I don't file for them. Often they will have an attorney file the paperwork for them. Yep. But that is like if you're do it yourself or just to be aware, because that will affect you moving forward. But so good, so reassuring to know that that divorce decree trumps it and that states that it's probably making it easier for that party to purchase the home. Yeah. And, and one of the things that I get quite a few calls on uh, from the clients and even the attorneys is the, the divorce decree will be finalized and the exiting spouse will be wanting to go out and look for a home. And the attorney for 
the exiting spouse will call the other attorney and put pressure on them to hurry up and have your client remove my client's name from the mortgage because they want to go buy a house. Yeah. And that is just unneeded pressure. So I'll get an attorney that'll call me that'll say, hey, Brett, I thought you said, you know, that if this indemnification word is, wording is in there, they can go buy a house. And I'll say, yeah. And they say, well, their loan officer is telling them that's that they have to use that debt against them. And that's just one of those scenarios where it, the the mortgage loan officers who aren't specializing in this realm right. just don't come across it often enough to really understand. That, that's just one of the areas. So good to know and to educate people if they're using a loan officer that's not familiar to to know this. So that's that's really important. Okay, so now tell me, so how child support and maintenance can be used to qualify for a mortgage. So this is the case where sometimes like maybe dad was a stay-at-home dad and both parties agree that they want him to stay in the home and okay. he wants to refinance it on his own, but he doesn't quite have the income coming in to cover sure. that. So he's getting some maintenance. He's getting some child support. How does that work when he's refinancing? Great question. Um, or even if the, if the person that was the stay-at-home parent wants to go out and purchase either yep. way, re refinance or purchase, it, it qualifies the same basically on a refinance or purchase, but to use, and we have this a significant amount of time where the stay-at-home parent, or maybe they're working part-time, right? right. Um, and they, and after the divorce, they're ramping up to full, more like a full-time, but they, they want to buy a house or refinance before they get to that point in time or have the new job or, or increase their hours but they have this spousal maintenance or child support that can help bridge that gap to get them to that mortgage transaction sooner than they would otherwise. So this child support and spousal maintenance are just, they're treated as individual income streams, just like a job, right? If you have an income from a job, you also have income from child support and income from spousal maintenance. They're treated separately, but they follow the same guidelines. So the, the payments for, each of those income streams have to be received for six months or more on That's a conventional loan, um, three months or more on a FHA, but we really don't see a ton of FHAs. FHA is less than 4% of the market these days. So um, Brett, I'm sorry, I just have to yeah. jump in. So that makes things a little tricky for a family that wants to move on and that parent is relying um, on that income. They're going to have to wait six months. Well, so that's the point. So when I, I, you know, of course, as a mortgage, uh, someone helping them more navigate their mortgage transaction, it hopefully I'm brought in to the to the divorce process on the early side so that we can help set them up for success so yes. that they can refinance or purchase right when the divorce decree is finalized using that income. Uh, if we set it up properly, and that would be uh, temporary spousal maintenance or temporary child support. And the question is, can we use temporary child support or temporary spousal maintenance? The answer is we can use it towards the, the six month clock, right? But the divorce decree has to be finalized, but then you don't have to wait another six months after. But it has to be, the temporary support has to be set up properly because a lot of people, what they want to do is, you know, the, the person who exited the house for while they're going through the divorce moves their income into their own account, and then they just throw money into their joint account that they've always had, right. and that becomes uh, commingled funds. So underwriters don't don't like seeing that. So if I can help them structure it enough ahead of time. I have a lot of clients who are able to do their mortgage transaction right after the decree is finalized without having to wait that six month period. It just has to be set up properly. And uh, that, that, that's a big deal. This is, this is awesome. And this is where you work so well with mediation and where I need to be calling you in right at that initial consultation so that those wheels, and that's how you can be creative, right? That's how yep. you can make these creative decisions. Um, and this, honestly, 
is something that I am just learning. And I've been doing this for a long time, which is kind of a shocker to me, but I'm just so thankful because it is really going to help people with their planning and what to do with their home. Do you, yeah, so wanna, the, Oh, well, sorry. I'll fin I want to finish that because the, the, there's a, there's a look back time of six months and then there's a look ahead period of three years. And there can be quite a bit of structuring that happens with that because if <laughs> Let's say that on the spousal maintenance side, they they say in the divorce decree that they'll receive spousal maintenance of X amount per month for three years. Well, the day after that divorce decree is, is signed by the judge, that's one day less than three years. And we can't use a dime of that in, as qualifying income for the mortgage. So what we do is try and help them help the client structure that so that they have maybe structure it for four years. Maybe they take less of a lump right. sum initially right. and add that to add that to the, the another year. So they're getting four years of it. That gives us one year to um, have the six month clock go by and then another six months to find a house or, or do your refinance transaction so that you're not um, you're not cut off for the time frame. So that, that's a big piece of the structuring on spousal maintenance and on child support side. It's it's kind of implied that whatever your child support is going to remain until the child is, is emancipated. Right. Yeah. So if you have a 10 year old child, you're okay using a hundred percent of the child support income that's in the decree. But if you have a, a 15 or a 16 year old, you can't use a dime of that because the implication is that the emancipation is less than three years and therefore we can't use any of it. So yeah. just knowing how, what, what, amounts can be used in the time frames and, and structuring it properly is uh, a big piece of what I do. And can be a game change changer for people yeah. and really help them be a little bit more at ease, make the process. So I love this. I love learning this from you. Okay. Can you um, talk about the two parts? Like one's the title and one's the mortgage. Can you just explain for the listeners the difference between the two? Yeah, sure. So this is a very, very uh, un. Uh, this isn't understood by very many people and clients. So this is a big deal to kind of know early on because there's a title and there's a a mortgage of who's responsible to repay the bank, right? And those can be completely different. And there's different ways of changing each of those as far as uncoupling the mortgage and the uncoupling the home. So on the title side, it's a lot easier. Mm -hmm. If both people are on title and they want to remove a name from title because the divorce is final or whatever, a lot of times the divorce decree will just say that, that uh, their title rights are extinguished. Um, and they will use like a quit claim deed, Q-U-I-T. Sounds like quick, but right. a quit claim deed to which is just a easy one or two page document that gets filed with the county recorded with the county that says hey i uh i'm giving my 50 percent title rights ownership rights of this property to my ex-spouse and it gets recorded it's a hundred and some dollars for recording fees and it's done it's easy you can do it at any time removing a name that's the title is different than who's responsible to repay the bank that is harder to do because then that you're talking about refinancing to remove a name or, you know, because the bank says whoever signed up to pay, repay this loan, they're responsible until we remove a name through a name delete assumption, which we'll get into in a minute, or they refinance to remove a name or the home is sold. Right. So, um, that's the harder part. And sometimes I, I get sometimes where people will come to me and say, oh, no, we, we got the we got the name thing taken care of. We're doing a quick claim deed. And I say, no, that's just the, to, to change the title rights of the property. It doesn't do anything with the responsibility to repay. OK, and I'm just thinking I do have an interesting couple um, and they actually both want to stay on the mortgage and they have their reasons. And a lot of attorneys have a really hard time with that. But as long as they understand what they're doing and that they're both responsible, I'm kind of, you know, I'm okay with helping them design their own divorce. But, mm -hmm. um, you know. 
Well, there's actually there's actually a, a, a decent reason sometimes to mm -hmm. leave both names on the title because for tax purposes. So um, I'm not a tax person, so I'll disclaim that right now. But there's when when you go to sell a house and and you're a single person, you have a capital gains exclusion of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So if you've been in the house for a long time and, and you have more than two hundred and fifty thousand dollars or, or I, uh, yeah, more than two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in in growth that you would be taxed on, you're exempt for two hundred and fifty thousand for one person. But a married couple is exempt up to five hundred thousand. But if you remove a name in the divorce and then two years later, you go to sell the house and you have three hundred and eighty thousand dollars, that's that's capital gains. Well, because you're the only name on it, you're going to have to pay uh, taxes on one hundred and eighty or one hundred and thirty thousand dollars. The difference so, Brett, where you would have been at five hundred exemption. OK, so are you kind of saying in their situation, they want to both remain on the deed, even if they're going to be divorcing? Well, I wouldn't go that far. I, I, there's all kinds of reasons to remove or <laughs> stay on. But I would say that is that can be a reason if the numbers are lining up okay. such that they would have that capital gain. That, okay. that, that could be an element to the discussion. Okay, that that's really really good to know. Okay, and we kind of, I mean, we kind of talked about this. When can I purchase a new home? You know, we talked about that. I think already. Is there anything else you want to cover on that? There was something about two I wanted to ask about. Can they get a co-signer? I mean, is that something that anyone can do? Yeah, there's actually more to the the timing of purchasing a new home. Um, <clears throat> so. There's a spectrum of, of lenders in the mortgage world from credit unions and banks to mortgage companies. And, and not all lenders are um, as flexible with Fannie and Freddie's guidelines as other lenders. Mm -hmm. um, as a mortgage company, uh, and this isn't a promotion, it's just why I'm at a mortgage company as, as opposed to a bank. With a mortgage company, they look at Fannie and Freddie guidelines and take them at face value. They don't overlay uh, some of the guidelines like a lot of the banks do. So one of the, one of the overlays is <clears throat> um, that banks typically will not allow a purchase uh, of a home or a mortgage transaction if somebody's going through a divorce prior to the divorce being finalized because, and, and it kind of makes sense because there's, there's, issues up in the air, right? If you don't have an agreement on how much child support or spousal maintenance will be or what the division of assets will be, you can understand that. But there's, I won't go into the detail on this, but there are um, there are situations, and it's a case-by-case -case thing, where mm -hmm. we can do a, a, a transaction on a purchase or refinance prior to the divorce being finalized. And um, so, Whereas, so the, the takeaway here is that you might talk to a bank, your credit union or somebody, and they might say, no, you come back and talk to us when the divorce is finalized. And, and the client will go, okay, you know, and I'll just live in my basement for the next uh, year and a half while we go through this divorce. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't have to be that way if, if they have the right situation, um, a non-bank can uh, potentially do Alone. That's interesting because I know that I have had people that have come to me and we have the consult and then we meet again and they're like, well, we bought another house. It was right in the same neighborhood. And then they did it, at, you know, because they could each finance on their own. Yep. Um, so it must work sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. It's case by case. But yeah. what you're going to get with a bank is if, if you're in a if you're in a divorce process, the, they just uh, won't allow it right off the bat. Okay. Okay. Well, now my last question is that big one that everyone's asking about, can I keep my current interest rate? Yeah. Well, did you want to talk about the cosigner first? Well, yes, I think I did. Uh, sorry. Because <laughs> I, I just want to make sure I answer all your yes, questions. Yes. Thank you. I do want to talk about the cosigner. Cosigners are um, utilized quite a bit in, in the divorce realm. 
Um, I think it's just because, you know, when, when a child is going through a divorce, uh, it's a tough time in life. And whether that child is, you know, 28 years old or 48 years old, what I find is parents want to help their child get through that time in their lives. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times uh, parents will, will step in and say, hey, whatever we need to do. And that actually is a big deal a lot of times. So, so take the take the stay at home parent or the parent who has, um, you know, a, a part time job, but they're looking for full time work, but they don't want to wait to purchase a house. They don't want to move twice. This house that came up is perfect. A, a co-signer can help bridge that gap and often does help bridge that gap. We do a lot of co-signers. So that's it's just something that people don't think of too much if they think, well, I can't I can't. I don't have the income to qualify, so I, I'm just going to have to rent. Um, right. But but thinking about the cosigner helps a lot. Um, to remember that as a creative option is yeah. really important. So yeah, okay the 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 big <laughs> one because rates are up from three percent to I mean we have people that are in in the twos for a thirty year fix because we did get into the twos uh, a couple of times over the last number of, uh, over the last uh, few years after COVID. Um, and they don't want, if they're going through a divorce, they don't want to give up that, you know, 2.875 or that three and a quarter interest rate to get a rate in the sixes. And we've had, we've had some times that are, we're in the sevens. So um, that's a huge difference in monthly payment, even on the same principal balance. So, so right now, everybody's wanting to keep their rate, whoever's keeping the house. And um, so it's called a qualifying name delete assumption where you just go to your current servicer of the loan. So if your servicer is U.S. Bank, you go to U.S. Bank and say, hey, do you guys do qualifying name delete assumptions? They'll say, hopefully say yes, if you get to the right person. I know sometimes they say no. And I always tell my my clients, go to the assumptions department. Is that correct? Is that where they need to? Absolutely. That is really okay. good advice. Absolutely. Okay. Because if you just call the, you know, the, the, the teller, and ask about that. Of course, they're not going to know. Even if you talk to a loan officer at at U.S. Bank, let's say they're not going to know. Um, they tip loan, most loan officers don't know anything about a name delete assumption. So you're often, unless you get to the under or to the uh, appraisal or <laughs> sorry the uh, assumptions department, you're often going to get a no um, just because they don't know. So yeah, right. I always tell people go to the assumptions department. So that's good advice. And I have had, I would feel like a strong amount of people who have been able to do it. I'm hearing that it's not allowed often, but I'm seeing it happening for people. So, so I think what's happened, it used to be prior to a year ago be, before rates went up and pushed everybody, uh, to want to do one of these. It used to be that really only the big banks would allow a name delete assumption. So you kind of had to be lucky enough, even if you did your loan with, you know, Chase uh, three years ago, you might not still be serviced by Chase. Chase might have sold that off to, you know, New Res, right. uh, one of these larger uh, uh, servicers. And so you just have to kind of be lucky enough that your your current servicer will allow a name delete assumption. It used to be only the big banks, but that's, that's changed. I've seen that that's gotten more... Uh, more flexible from a lot of places. I've even seen credit unions do them who traditionally haven't. Um, some of the servicers will do them. Yeah. So it's it's really just, and I think it's changing all the time, honestly. I've had clients who have told me that one servicer doesn't do it and then and and I and they went to the assumptions department and then somebody else months later has said that 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 they will. So it you just really have to call your servicer and see if they'll allow it. And the, the difficulty is they're just not easy to go through um, because these servicers are not making that hoop easy for them to jump through. They're, they're really kind of, they're sending out some paperwork for them to fill out, to send back. It's taking a long time to get a response. And they often will just come back and say, well, you don't have an FHA or a USDA loan or a VA loan, which are, are typically assumable. You have a conventional loan, which typically isn't, and, and they'll just stop there. Um, but you had to wait a long time to get that answer. So right. it's a little frustrating. I'm seeing clients be frustrated with that, and rightfully so. But um, but if they can 
they can stay the course if they have time, you know, if they've, if they've got a spouse that is, uh, and they're amicable enough where they negotiate that time frame uh, in their divorce decree, then I'm seeing it, it's, it's obviously worth the wait given where yeah. rates are at. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, Brett, this has been, this has gone so fast, so much juicy, good information that I learned that the listeners are going to love to know about, to be able to design their divorce, how they want to have some relief about the home. But now as we, you know, get into the tail end, because I'm in a barn and I've got horses back there, I call it the saddle up segment where I always have my guests Tell me just one tidbit or one little piece of information that the listeners can do right now or just something that's going to help them. Can you leave us? You've given us so much, but is there anything that you can leave us with? I think the thing that the the, the takeaway from, from this is if, if you don't know what's going on with the mortgage piece and you want to help navigating that, there's somebody out there who can help. Um, and it's, it just help them illuminate that dark room, right? It, it help them navigate that, figure out what their options are. They don't have to do the research. They don't have to, you know, which almost literally impossible to do research online about all this, uh, and, and navigate their specific situation. Um, but just know that there's someone out there that can help navigate that, um, I don't charge anything for helping people through it. I enjoy that part of it. Um, but it, there's somebody out there to help them structure the divorce decree and stuff like that. So it, just know that there's that that assistance out there where, and also that most loan officers are not going to be very well versed in that. That's probably the other heads up. Right, right. Amen. Okay, so listeners, call Brett or <laughs> another mortgage professional who's, works in divorce. Is that what, what are, yeah. was it called a certified divorce? What mortgage person? Um, uh, divorce mortgage specialist. Divorce mortgage specialist. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So Brett, if my listeners want to reach out, find you, how do they do that? And we'll have it in the show notes, but if you can just tell them. Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, so you can go to my website, mortgageforest.com. Uh, F O R E S T mortgageforest.com. Uh, you can look me up, give me a call, um, send me an email. Uh, I'm, I'm available to, to help people get through this. All right. Wonder. I, I can't thank you enough for taking the time. And honestly, this went so fast. I yeah. learned, the listeners learned, and we're going to just give them a little piece through this piece of their divorce. So thanks for being here, Brett. Super. You're welcome. Thanks. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.